time as well. <laughs> All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shola Adishwe. I'm the Associate Dean for Research and External Funding for the College of Education. Uh, on behalf of the College of Education and the Planning Committee, which uh, includes Dr. A.J. Rod and Laura Girardo, I want to welcome everyone to the very first research conversation of this academic year, 2023-2024. Um, today, we are fortunate to have two excellent scholars who will be kicking off our research presentations this academic year, A.J. Rod, as well as Mark Fagiano. A.J. Rod is a distinguished professor of cultural studies and social thought in education. He's nationally known for his expertise in the philosophical dimensions of education. His research focuses on the cultural foundations of education, particularly the moral dimensions of teaching, learning, and leading. Uh, A.J. Rod is past president of the John Dewey Society, and edited its peer-reviewed international journal, Education and Culture, for six good years. He is past chair of the Dewey Studies Special Interest Group of the American Educational Research Association. He is also president of the Philosophy of Education Society. He is widely published in his field and widely known uh, internationally as well. Uh, uh, for being for his work in philosophy of education. And AG recently contributed to and co-edited two books on Dewey. Personally, I have also been privileged to work with AG Rod on a number of projects, uh, including co-editing a book together on contemporary technologies in education. I don't know if you can see. Um, yes. Can yeah. see it. Yeah, so we both co-edited this book, Contemporary Technologies in Education, Maximizing Student Engagement, Motivation, and Learning. The book won the 2020 Society of Professors of Education Outstanding Book Award. And um, AG, I have to say, AG contributed immensely to uh, the intellectual uh, development of that book. So um, I have known AG at many, many levels. And that book was as a result of the $40,000 grant that AG and I and a few others wrote, and which we won, uh, to bring top scholars in educational technology to the WSU Pullman campus here. I really appreciate the working relationship I've had with AG and the work we have done together. I'm glad that you are venturing to other uh, more contemporary spaces in technology of, edu uh, of education and humanity. So I'll be glad to listen to your talk today. Uh, Mark Fagiano is an assistant professor of philosophy at WSU. His research focuses on philosophical problems in the disciplines of ethics, social and political philosophy and the philosophy of technology. As a pragmatist, Dr. Fagiano's research is grounded in the vision of William James. For those who know William James, really, really um, um, classic researcher when it comes to philosophy, um, especially the theory of relations. Dr. Fagiano explores pressing existential and social problems that are related to the pursuit of living a good life. In his teaching, he aims to help students learn how philosophical reflection can assist them in making important life decisions. I've also had the privilege of meeting with Mark, uh, and I can say he is such an engaging scholar uh, and is very much excited about about this work. Today, both AG and Mark will present on one of their projects entitled XR, AI, and Ethical Decision-Making in Humanities and Education. Please join me in welcoming these excellent, excellent scholars, Dr. AG Rod and Dr. Mark Fagiano to our research conversation today. Thank you so much, Shola. Uh, uh, the way we'll proceed is that uh, Mark will talk first, uh, I will talk second, and then Mark has some things at the end if we have time to show people. So Mark, you can uh, begin and I'll be clicking away for you. 
Great. Thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. Our title is XR AI and Ethical Decision Making, Humanities and Education. So I'm going to start by talking about some of the reasons why I'm drawn to um, XR and AI in the discipline of philosophy, how I came to this point, and then turn it over to AG and his uh, discussion about the uh, uh, possibility of using these emerging technologies in education. Uh, there we are there. There are two uh, uh, on our list. If we go to the next slide, I just want to start maybe by talking about defining XR, uh, right? Because this is maybe not a term people are familiar with. XR is really an umbrella term under which we have VR, uh, AR, and MR. So this we have to have some more definitions there. Um, in terms of, right, VR is usually, uh, right, we think of it as having a headset on. You are actually transported to a different sort of reality or scene where there are certain sorts of things that can be done there. Uh, AR is a superimposition of di different digital elements in the reality you now are, 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 are experiencing. And MR is a mix of both, right? Um, so we want to talk about the benefit of bringing in XR technologies to, to WSU and beyond it. And that's a good way to start. On the next slide here, um, right, the main question we want to ask is what might be the educational benefits of incorporating, X, incorporating XR and AI technologies into the teaching of ethics, other humanities courses, as well as pre-service teacher education uh, courses for, for, for our students, um, right? So with X, AI, right, I think you all have probably tried uh, chat GPT, uh, right? So as an ethicist or a philosopher, uh, right, I look at this uh, development and it's very, very promising. It's been very helpful in my own research, but there are a lot of ethical questions that we need to talk about as a community. Uh, for instance, just one thing we could say is that it's very easy for any student, uh, if they have the right prompts and say ChatGPT, if they have an advanced uh, version of ChatGPT, a paid version, it's very easy for any student to be able to put in, uh, design certain prompts uh, with, a, with a ChatGPT and, and write very sophisticated essays. And I don't think anyone could really tell the difference because even if they were to have the first version of the uh, AI written <laughs> paper, they can just keep putting it back in, refeeding it back in and have something at the end where it, it doesn't resemble, it, it really can't be understood as something produced by AI. So there's major ethical questions about AI beyond just ChatGPT, which is just an, an LLM, you know, just a, a way of, uh, of, of predicting uh, certain possibilities, you know, uh, certain words that might come next after the model has been designed. Beyond that, AI is obviously in many different other areas uh, of interest in, in the world and different sorts of meanings, what, it, what AI really is, is doing. Uh, one of the things that's a big ethical question is the production of bias by different LLMs, but also, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in different different um, situations, you have uh, bias that really isn't expected, and that's called uh, the value alignment problem, right? So how is it that we make certain that AI is aligned with our values? You might even, right, by saying that, there might be a problem ethically about determining what that means, what precisely are our values, right? But today we want to look at AI in the incorporation to be incorporated into these XR uh, simulations we're creating. Uh, the next slide then, my own problem, my own issue in philosophy has to do with the uh, inability of what we call thought experiments in philosophy to uh, change habits. I don't know if you've all heard of thought experiments. Uh, if in the next slide, we go to the next slide, we can, we can talk about the very common one, the trolley car, right? Uh, the trolley car is a thought experiment we give to students in ethics classes, and it goes something like this, right? There's a trolley coming down a track, and right now uh, there's it's going to be hitting uh, and killing five people, right? But you're right by that area, and you can push a button and change the track off to only kill one person. So the thought experiment is, what would you do? Would you change the track? or would you allow it to kill five people? 
Now, another version of this that's always um, introduced right after is like, well, what, what if you pushed somebody into the way of the car and that person died uh, to prevent five people from being killed? That's another scenario. And so the, almost 80% say on the first situation that they would push the button, but about 80% say they wouldn't push the person. So what this tells us, right, is that, you know, it's not just all about the consequences. It's also about the manner which we by which we achieve them. And that's the main takeaway. The problem is when students, you know, after, after going through this experiment, thought experiment, what actually happens to the student's behavior? How are habits changed if they're changed at all? So that's the, I, I felt like, well, you know, maybe I can look into XRs a few years back and, and try to figure out how we can, on the next slide, uh, introduce beyond thought experiments to think about embodied experiences. So from the thought experiment to embodied experience. It, with the embodied experience, clearly we have a different sort of uh, phenomena that's happening in the body right? It involves visceral and, e and emotional uh, relations to the problem, not just uh, an abstract thought about what we might do if we encounter a trolley or something else. And, and so when we place people within an XR simulation, this embodied and visceral experience, I, we, 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 we uh, uh, believe that there'll be different sorts of, uh, of conclusions that are drawn from that sort of experience. Uh, on the next slide, right? I find this to be important because in philosophy, I mean, if you define, if you look up what the definition of morality is, it's usually something about moral principles, finding the right moral principles, and then having those principles guide and govern your behavior. Okay, well, a lot of work recently has shown that that, that is actually uh, a setting up for people to fail oftentimes when they have pressured situations or when they rationalize the principle so much that it's so abstract, it can fit any of the needs. So the mere holding of moral principles does not seem to govern and guide our behavior as people have thought for, for thousands of years. A great work on this is by C. Daniel Batson, Why Morality Fails. Uh, and that's if you're interested in that, he has a great research about that exact problem, right? How Mere, the mere holding of moral principles does not govern and guide our behavior, right? So mere thought experience likewise uh, fail in the sense of, of they can establish a principle for action, but they're not changing habits, right? How do we develop habits and thought and thought and action uh, by using these XR technologies? And that's my one of my main questions, right? Uh, on the next slide, we see here, right, <laughs> again, a, a habit formation. Uh, there's so many different situations we can design within XR uh, that will allow for a repetition, a repetition of an experience, which is the practice of the experience or the judgment, which can lead to very different consequences and very different outcomes than mere, merely just thinking about it. And again, I don't wanna say anything bad about philosophy. I mean, I'm in philosophy, I love philosophy, but I think you all can understand now maybe some of the limits I'm thinking about in terms of if philosophy just talks about these ideas and we think about these situations, we'll get very different sorts of results if people are actually having embodied experiences and we have we can design the XR to be able to have some sort of actual habit formation, right? And whatever way, in whatever, whatever way it may come out. Uh, then on the next slide here, um, right? That our main goal of our project with AG and I, uh, we are, are partnering with the XR Development Lab, and we're going to be creating an ethics extended reality uh, lab, uh, focusing on problems of moral decision making, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in both education and ethics. Now, some of these terms like diversity, equity, inclusion are often thrown around as good ideals. Uh, a lot of times, what we find is that they are incorporated into different sorts of compliance, right? So we speak about these things in terms of compliance, like we need to make sure we're following this so we don't get sued. That's an important dynamic. I understand the ends of, of those uh, ways of using those terms, 
but we want to take it to another level, right? We want to think about it at a different level through XR, how we can start really having serious conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion at, at WSU beyond just the, the need for compliance, right? Uh, next slide. So the biggest part of our project, which I'm excited about, is to be able to, with other folks, create the infrastructure necessary for many different people in the university to uh, to to experiment with XR and AI to improve their classes and to create different sorts of, of research agendas, right? So uh, it's it's not just about us. This project's so neat because it's not about us, we have our own ideas of what we wanna do, but the creation of the infrastructure at the school will allow for all the brilliant people here at the school to really come up with ideas that I would have never even thought of and, and AG would have never thought of. And that's really the main goal I could say is, is from my in my heart to be able to create that infrastructure because it'll be so exciting to see what people come up with. Also in, in, in relationship to that infrastructure, the ability to collect data in XR, so in a simulation, the ability to collect data that can be used for research judgments people have to make uh, while researching, but also to create different ways of researching itself, right? If the infrastructure is there and we can collect data, I mean, it literally can transform the way we conduct research, at least in many of the social sciences uh, with, with, with which I'm familiar. Uh, the next slide is, let's see, right? Again, this is a lot stirring from my own ideas about ethics and the need to think about ethics contextually, right? When you have a moral principle and it's abstract and airy and, you know, <laughs> maybe you could fit it, I could use it to rationalize different sorts of, of actions. Uh, this project will allow us to think about ethics contextually and also from many different cultures. I mean, I was trained as an anthropologist Maybe that's uh, at, when I was at Cal Berkeley, I studied with Alan Dundies. I was trained as an anthropologist, so maybe that had something to do with my problems with philosophy. Um, but to have different sorts of approaches to thinking about ethics is important. And bringing in many different disciplines is likewise crucial for the success of this or any uh, XR and AI project on campus. And then finally, uh, before I turn it over to AG, the next one is just, you know, again, I mentioned. AI is, right, obviously we know it from ChatGPT. And then beyond that, there are things that Elon Musk is doing that is like not the same, it's far beyond uh, that, that development of AI. What we wanna do is use AI in the XR simulation. So imagine uh, for a second you have a situation where a student is experiencing some sort of moral decision and then the AI can actually generate different consequences uh, without having to write out the whole script. And the, the benefit of that is that writing the whole script may seem a little bit uh, like phony, <laughs> you know, versus AI generating different sorts of, of consequences and different sorts of uh, decision trees, really. Because, right, if you make a decision in the XR simulation, it will lead to one video or one experience rather than another. This can all be generated by AI. And the last thing to say is uh, also XR, uh, sorry, within XR, we can use AI, we can develop a chatbot, right? And that chatbot can be placed within avatars or characters within a gaming environment or within a scenario to try to show something about making decisions. And it can respond to people within the simulation without, again, having to be programmed. So... We're very excited with this. I know a lot of this is very embryonic uh, and there's a lot of different ways people are using these things. And I hope what we've said here will start up a conversation amongst amongst people at WSU and, and beyond it. So with that, I think that's all I have for, for me and I'll turn it over to AG. Thank you, Mark. That was, that was wonderful. Uh, what I'm going to stress, I'm going to talk about really how we can use this kind of these kinds of technologies within the College of Education specifically. And I'm also going to talk about really uh, the uh, philosopher that in influences us most is an 
is an ancient Macedonian named Aristotle who talked about habit formation as part of, of ethics and how, how habits are so important to think about to uh, not only uh, uh, inscribe those kinds of ethical uh, feelings and principles within you, but but to embody them and to have them as part of your, your daily action. So habits are, are very important. I see this XR uh, and, and uh, initiative as really being helpful to what I do with undergraduates, with pre-service teacher education students. Uh, students encounter um, you know, ethical dilemmas and situations in teacher education classes. I teach te uh, Teach Learn 301, and I've taught MIT 501, our two uh, learning and development classes for uh, undergraduates and for our special master's in teaching program. And one particular, I'll just give one particular example here of, of, a, of an ethical dilemma that is part of the text that I've used. I've used texts of case studies and, and ethical scenarios uh, in this class that are very effectively, I think. Uh, one is that uh, a teacher is uh, talking about 9-11 uh, uh, probably right about the time 9-11 occurs to a, a group of students in a fifth grade class. And within that class, uh, th there are some Muslim students, but one student will, gets up and talks about how uh, the Muslims are terrorists and uh, we should defend our country and this was very bad and so forth. What does the teacher do in that situation? The teacher has a whole class in front of him or her. Uh, they have brought up, uh, she's talking, as uh, she or he are talking about this situation. And then a student gets up and, and spouts uh, a view like that. How does the teacher deal with it? Uh, we can talk about how, how the teacher deals with it in class. And I've done that before. You can take the student outside of the class, talk about it. You could make it a lesson for everyone to talk about. You could deal with it in a number of different ways. With an XR situation, you could have a, a an immersive situation with decision trees generated by AI that would give multiple interpretations and consequences for pre-service teachers. So I think that this is a very powerful way of inscribing this kind of knowledge, of embodying this kind of knowledge for our teacher education students. It can be extended to other, stu uh, to an other students, such as uh, educational leadership students, any sort of counseling students, any sort of helping profession would, would have an opportunity to do this. And then we'll talk at the end, if we have time, about, um, about health, uh, given a little example of that. So merely thinking about moral choices does not change one's character or future actions. We very strongly as Aristotelians in ethics believe that. So XR technologies can simulate these moral sensations that students may have in an actual situation and move them beyond reflection to habit development. So AI technologies, de decision trees, and XR experiences is what uh, I'm very excited about trying out with my students. Uh, this uh, particular uh, example at the end, Mark has done a number of different uh, activities and research and development within healthcare and within industry. And Mark, would you take it over now and talk a little bit about uh, empathy in healthcare and show us uh, the kinds of things that you have worked on to give people an idea. These are very easily translated into the other helping professions such as teaching and so forth. So Mark. That's right. So thank you so much, uh, A.G. Great, great, great uh, presentation. And so I've had uh, the opportunity to work with a number of different people in healthcare and 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 create different XR simulations to solve problems. So that's the one thing to think in terms of if you ever want to incorporate any of this, like what sort of problem is there and how could uh, XR or AI actually help to solve the problem? So the big problem in healthcare, I was thinking in terms of, right, not having enough empathy uh, for patients. Uh, this is how I started off thinking about it. Like when nurses and doctors are so very busy, uh, right. It's, 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 they have a lot more paperwork than they used to have. And, um, 
how could we create different sorts of simulations that could measure different behaviors, but also provide a, a, a teaching uh, experience for different folks in healthcare. So I thought immediately, like what sort of problems could it solve? So on the next slide, we see that, right, one of the things that happened in healthcare is that there's the HCAP scores. If you don't know what that is, that's uh, an HCAP is, is a, an, a survey that is sent to people after they stay at the hospital and then people fill it out and then they return it. Now, those surveys and those scores basically measure empathy. I mean, they measure communication abilities of nurses and doctors and how the patient felt while he or she was being treated. So, right, I can go into a hospital, for example, and I have a bad heart. They can give me a brand new heart and I can be in perfect health. But when I get that survey, it's not about whether I got a, a new heart. <laughs> it's about whether I, how I felt I was treated now, this is very important since the introduction of Obamacare. It's very important, these scores, to try to create equity, right? To try to make sure that equity is happening in the treatment of different patients. And there's a there's a there's an additional uh, dynamic is that the, the places, the hospitals that score very high on these scores get reimbursed up to 3%, right? From um from Medicare, Medi-Cal, right, in, in Tennessee. So they get reimbursed 3% based on these scores. So then I was thinking, okay, so let's create this uh, to be able to solve that problem. Now, related to low patient satisfaction scores, right, with the when hospitals will not be getting great reimbursements for the government, you have a lot of different things emerging. For instance, the people who score the lowest are actually sued more. So lack of empathy, actually more lawsuits. You have more uh, worse medical outcomes, right? You have patients who, if they don't, aren't treated with empathy, they have uh, they have a, a less tendency to adhere to important treatment recommendations. A lack of empathy in uh, can also lead to physician burnout and compassion fatigue, high turnover rates, costly readmissions, and a bad reputation. So those were the problems. So again, this is just an example, and just to try to illustrate, if people are interested in this, the you can use it to solve problems, right? And you can use it to instruct in a certain way that can overturn these very costly problems in healthcare. Uh, the next slide, I think we have an example, right? So what, ha what happened with me is some people came up and said, hey, you know, we're having problems between our doctor, I mean, our, our surgeons and our nurses uh, because our surgeons are <laughs> treating our nurses very badly and very rudely. They're not being, they're not responding to different emotional states and being caring, really. So we made this for them. Um, and basically in this, this little picture here, you, you watch the people interact and then a question is posed. So with a lot of these in XR simulations, you can, you can, you can see a scenario and then you make your own judgments. So for this one, there was a situation that just happened between these two, and then you can select without even being prompted before, how many emotions did you see? It doesn't say look for how many emotions. So it's a test. Now, if you get it wrong, the old way of getting things wrong is that you just get marked off for and you get a 60% instead of a 70. With this, if you get it wrong, you just repeat. You just repeat it. And that is part of habit formation. It's the practice of doing things over, seeing differently. Here it is again, right? So, I mean, you wouldn't go on forever like this, but instead of just calculating and saying, well, this is what your score is, it repeats if they get it wrong. So the answer here is seven or more. If you select three in this one, then it repeats, right? And then three is gone. It's a different way of approaching. And then on the next slide, um, right? You can also, just so you can see a visual here, you can put, different sorts of things within it, superimposed within the VR. In this example, uh, right after uh, that situation with the emotions, we find out that that doctor who wasn't treating the nurse well was actually suffering from burnout. So now we shift our empathic concern to the doctor who was being mean before to try to understand the depths of what's happening. And this is just an example of how you can superimpose a video right in there, in the simulation. And then uh, finally, I think, uh, is that it? And then here's two two examples here about empathy and the doctor, right? This is from the position of the patient, right? So <laughs> this is for doctors and nurses to be the patient now. And they have the doctor and nurse come in and, and just basic things, how they can learn about interacting with the patient, 
right? And in this case, the doctor is avoiding eye contact. And eye contact is very important with a doctor uh, 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 patient relationship. And then lastly, here is the situation where we have a doctor sitting down before giving a diagnosis. Now, it, we, we know this for a fact is that when a doctor comes in and gives a diagnosis uh, and, and stands up, she or he, right, will get lower scores on considering if the person was empathic. If the doctor sits down, their empathic score goes up. And if they ask to sit down before they sit down, then the score even goes up very high. It's considered to be a very empathic way uh, for delivering a diagnosis. So you it, these examples, right, it, just to show that the multiple ways in which we can design these contextually to solve different problems and to instruct folks in different ways, right? I think that's it for for us. Yeah, that that is it. And uh, we now uh, have an opportunity uh, to talk until the the, the hour uh, from you, hear from you, from your ideas. Because as Mark said, we're talking about, we're really interested in, in being part of building a structure. There are other people that are working on this uh, around the university and in our college. Uh, uh, Jonah and Don, and uh, of course uh, Joy Egbert with her lab that we're we're starting to collaborate with. So building a structure to think about this because um, I'm sure you've all noticed that every day we get barraged by things about uh, artificial intelligence, AI, and so forth. And uh, one of the ways I came out of thinking about this is the the theme of uh, the Philosophy of Education Society meeting coming up in March in Salt Lake City is information, misinformation, and disinformation. And so uh, this uh, whole theme of how uh, technology is facilitating um, disinformation in our country is, is of great concern to me in democracy. And one of the ways I think of, so, so like a generative way of thinking about technology is thinking about AI, XR, and so forth, uh, helping us to develop uh, habits of listening, habits of, of of good character, and so forth. So I'd be interested to hear about any any thoughts anyone has or any questions anyone has about this. Looks like we got a good group of people here. Any questions? I can run the questions since I'm. Ag, used I put to... a question in the chat for you. Oh, sure. Boy, I see a problem. What if the doctor has Asperger's and you're trying to make him look me in the eye, for example? Good question, Joy. Uh, Mark, what, what what do you think about that? With the, the whole eye contact thing, and if yeah. the doctor does not want to have eye contact. And that's exactly why- There could be teachers too, yeah. of course, any help, helping profession. And that is exactly why we would do this at, in a simulation. A perfect example of why it's done in a simulation to make adjustments and to alter contextually what people think. So this is all, again, never a final word. I'm a pragmatist. I don't believe in final words. <laughs> I believe in continued conversation and figuring out how to, to piecemeal in a piecemeal fashion, reconstruct things to make them the best. So that is great. And that is brilliant. That's part of it. Right. And so in this sort of environment, it's safe. There's a safe environment where we create these conversations versus actually in the real world. Right. It's a phenomenal question. That's that is really the whole point of it is to be able to have different conversations where different sorts of approaches may not right function for all. And that is the perfect example of what, what I was talking about with ethics and context. Right. And the, but those can't come about unless we create some sort of beginning point. Uh, so I think that's fantastic. That's exactly what the goal is for me, <laughs> is to be able to have uh, different sorts of contextual understanding and and and, and not just uh, a monolithic way of approach to doing anything. Thank you, Joy. Other, other questions or comments? Want to hear from some people. I see some people from the XR lab here, some graduate students. Uh, any any thoughts you have?
So AG and Mark, if the graduate students are interested in maybe working with you on one of these projects or gathering data for their dissertations or other papers, can they just contact you or? Absolutely. Absolutely. That would that would be wonderful. And uh, I'm easy to find. Uh, so, yeah. And Mark and I would love to talk with with people, with graduate students who want to work on these issues. Thank you, Joy. Hey, hey GM, Mark. Thank, thank you so very much for your presentation. And uh, Joy, thanks for that question. I really would encourage uh, graduate students and, and faculty um, on Zoom to feel free to ask questions, but while waiting for those questions, I will ask you one. Um, one of the things that we've known in the literature is that when people are trained under extremely stressful situation uh, with, um, you know, um, artificial intelligence or other uh, virtual reality type of tools, uh, there is a rich literature showing that when those people encounter the actual stressful situation, they tended to sort of forget most of what they had learned with a virtual reality. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you take a you take a gun and a game and you shoot and someone died and the person is up and running again the next moment. That's not the way it is in real life. <laughs> so, so how do you, I mean, have you thought about uh, the, the difference between virtual reality and actual reality? Yeah, I mean, when people are confronted with a moral decision, when people have to deal with a situation whereby there's stress, there's emotion, um, there are ethical issues around it, um, would do you think this XR, AR, these forms of contemporary technology can actually help uh, uh, people make those decisions in a in a in an ethical way um, through such training rather than you know without without uh, such training? That's I mean that's one concern that I have. Pilots are trained, and then uh, with all of this. Um, uh, tools and and when they really enter very terrible situation, it's always scary for for many of them. And sometimes they truly forget most of what they have been taught to do. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, let me just say a few things here, Mark, and then you jump in. Uh, I think that uh, we we can only approximate uh, these kinds of situations. I, I think that it would be interesting to really investigate how you know how you could dial up the reality in an xr to make it is you know to, to dial up the stress level to to get people to react uh as much as you can to those situations so like i know what you're talking about and uh, i visited up in spokane and saw the uh the the lab there where they were training uh, uh people uh with shoot shooters and and you know these shooting situations when you're when you have a shooter and, and this is a, a common gaming situation of course uh so how do you how do you try try to ratchet that up mark what what ideas do you have on that well yeah, that's, that's a great it's, question it's, it's an excellent question it reminds me of what robert nozick said in his famous work on the experience machine right so you can go into the machine and you can have uh, certain sorts of experiences but does that mean that's going to be transferring over to our everyday world Look, I mean, first of all, the first thing to say is that's absolutely going to happen in some cases. It really depends, though, if we were even talking about the same thing. When we're talking about designing an XR simulation in one way versus another, you know, when a lot of studies come out and say, well, virtual reality or extended reality really doesn't work. I always look at like, well, how are you doing it? Right? Mm -hmm. How are you creating it? That makes a big difference, right? Just like as people, you can have different teachers and different teachers can say things that sync. I think the way in which we design the XR experiences matters a lot. And I have, I've actually had a lot of just the opposite experience. So, uh, and where I've created things and people have just realized, like for instance, the case with the emotions, um, 
you know, how they, I, I never really realized that I was acting that way or being emotional in that way when I was talking with somebody. I never realized I was neglecting that person's feelings when I was talking to them about the surgery. That's the sort of things that I've found. Um, and so that's going to be different. And it really depends upon how you create the experience. It matters. It's the curriculum design is what matters. And we can't say as monolithic title that all XR experiences are going to be created in the same way. And the last thing to say is like, this is all experimentalism, right? Uh, this is from AG and I's love of John Dewey, right? Is that this is these are experiments, right? And so the more experiments and the more experiential learning we create and the better we get at crafting it, right? And, and, and serving different interests and different purposes, I think you can get much different results. But the point is, so is, is very well taken. And I, I think that is something that, that needs to be thought, right? And, and the last thing to say is that when they're, we're doing these ex more experimental sorts of, of training, you know, there's this idea that this is a wrong idea to think like, well, you know, this is going to be like the magic bullet or whatever, or it's going to necessarily work. If these are, exper this is experimentalism par excellence, and it's always ready to be changed and altered according to, to, to reach certain ends. And so that's the, the kind of the difference I think that what AG and I are doing is that, you know, it's okay to change things, it's okay to, to redesign things to make them serve purposes. And I really do think that the design does make a big difference. Although uh, I could see how, uh, right, many different cases, people will freeze up anyway. I was an ocean lifeguard for a long time. And uh, when, you know, we are trained doing role play, right, of, 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 you know, saving people and doing CPR, people can train, be trained in CPR, and they'll freeze. So, right, this happens a lot. And I would suspect it would happen, continue to happen in VR, no matter how powerful the habit people are experiencing in the simulation, where in a high pressure situation, it's, it's tough sometimes because people will freeze, freeze up, right? So... Thanks, Mark. We have a question from Ali in the chat uh, that Shola relayed to us. Uh, talking about the avatar that serves as a chat box, Mark talked about, wouldn't we be worried that students may get the wrong information, considering it is connected to the internet? Well, I know Ali, he knows this stuff really well. So I would say we don't want to connect it to the internet. Why can't we have control of the inputs and not? have it connected, right? I mean, I don't know if, if this record, it's required that any sort of designer chatbot is connected totally to the internet. I think it's, right, if we have control of the inputs and we limit the inputs and have it a certain way, then there can only be so, some types of outputs, right? Uh, but that is a very big concern. <laughs> and obviously we don't have the money as like a, a, a Bard and these folks of ChatGPT to worry about, to, to, to design it in that way. But I think like if we limit the inputs and we don't doesn't have like just uh, access to everything, then I, I would say that there there could be different sorts of outputs, right, and different sorts of responses to any sort of uh, interaction. But Ali can speak to that probably better than I can. So, <laughs> well, no, I'm I'm just worried about like kind of, okay in this case, then we have to feed it up. We have to feed it the information that we want it to be used. Wouldn't that consider it kind of like we know the big knowledge, then we are sharing that with the child box? It's kind of, I don't know. I mean, I see it being used, but I'm just worried about the information that we're going to feed it to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a serious concern. That's, a, that's one of the biggest ethical questions about AI. And that's part of this conversation because, right, before we started this conversation, those that wasn't on my radar because in terms of the way of, I've done it. And so that's the great thing about all this is, is, is coming together and coming together and making decisions and being okay with changing things and, and uh, doing, and coming from that position of experimentalism. Mark, maybe you could just talk a little bit uh, um, about robotics and we, we haven't talked about that, but we we've thought about, you know, how this extends into people working in robotics and and say a, a few things like that and uh um we've got a couple other questions here in in the uh in well, the chat know. too yeah maybe we should turn to the chat i mean i'm willing to talk to anybody about that okay all right so uh joy has made some comments you can't download the whole ai though then it's then it's not random that would be hard to do um 
so she responded to Ali and so forth. Sarah Newcomer uh, said, that idea of freezing up just got me thinking that perhaps there might be a way to simulate that experience as well. There could be a, that could be a scenario, you're frozen in a situation, what do you do now? It seems uh, to me that the opportunity yeah. for reflection after the XRVR experience is key to helping the learning experience be even more powerful. Yes, absolutely. I mean, build the freezing into it right then. <laughs> wow, that's great. And that's the whole point of this whole conversation, all these these ideas and you know, coming together. Hope we can come together more and more and, and work together towards uh, mutually beneficial ends. Yeah, that's great. Any other questions anyone has as we come to the end of the hour? Another thing just to add is that, right, <laughs> the technology is going to be so explosive over the next five years. We might look back at this and all the dreams and I have aspirations I have may be totally altered, like even within six months. So again, this is why it's important to have these conversations and and uh, to be open to changing any sort of process, especially at the sheer rapidity where we, we will witness in the next five, 10 years, six months. Well, Mark, at the risk of leaving us on a, a downer here, I just wanted to talk. We've talk, been talking about progressive and interesting ideas to do with AI. What about some of the uh, dystopian ideas that uh, artificial intelligence will will take over and, uh, you know, harm or kill human beings? Uh, what do you think about that? And, and that sort of gets into these robotic situations, too. Do you have any thoughts about that that we could share? Well, you know, I I don't know how much access we have to what a lot of companies are doing. And I know they, they decided to put or try to put a moratorium because they were worried about some of the things, but we just don't know what's in, in the queue for them as far as development. I mean, maybe some people on this, in this chat have an idea. Um, I don't think, I think it's, you know, what we've seen, at least with chat GPT, um, there's a lot of issues with, you know, thinking philosophically, if we think philosophically about whether these are conscious, you know, if if if, if like a, there's some sort of AI infused robot that can operate around its environment, obviously it's conscious. In other words, awareness aware of um, the environment. Just how is it consciousness different from humans? And one of the things is that there's no reason for any AI, if it's a robot or anything, to be have to develop emotions, <laughs> right? I mean, this is a this is a biological thing that happened to us for survival. And to put it in, I, I couldn't even imagine that happening. Also, right, the intensive, like, how do you, how would you program a will uh, into AI? So these are a lot of different questions. And some of these things about, you know, AI is taking over. Uh, I think some of the questions have been shifting recently, thinking more in terms of how AI is going to be a weapon, whether if AI is going to be conscious and like, like, like us or like take over. I think that AI will be used as a weapon and that's what we really have to worry about in the next 10 years. How will AI be used as a weapon? This is beyond the things we're creating with XR and stuff. And this is, I think the most important question, how will AI be used as a weapon? Well, on that note, uh, that is a sad note. <laughs> sorry, folks. Um, I, I thank you all very much for coming to this conversation, and please reach out to me and to Mark. We're easily findable on email and uh, so forth, and uh, we'd love to meet with you and talk with you, have coffee with you, and talk about it. Uh, thanks for your questions, and thank you for your attendance. Really appreciate it. And thanks to Shola and to Laura uh, for uh, hosting this.